Okay, Year 9. So what we're going to do is have a look at the work that I set for you today on Monday the 14th of February. Um, and we're going to go through it in a bit more detail because I've had some inquiries about um, what you need to do with the, with the task um, and maybe to be worth going over a little bit of information about um, Harry Seidler as well, just so we're, you know, I'm giving you a bit more information than what's currently just on that slideshow. So let's have a look. So obviously to access this, all this information is located here on the Harry Seidler case study, um, but you can also access it through this announcement here from uh, Monday the 14th of February. So as I've said here, um, this term you'll be researching the life and work of the famous Australian architect Harry Seidler, um, who was a really influential architect in Australia mostly because he brought a very distinctly modern style of architecture to Australia, which was much more common in um, Europe at the time, especially in places like Germany, with the emergence of the Bauhaus architectural movement. Um, and I've also just said here, you're going to be completing a short research task. So this is not going to be a really in-depth thing. Um, it'll probably take you the rest of the lessons for this week, maybe one from next week. But um, it does require a little bit of research on your part. But a lot of the information I've um, also given you um, on that case study module as well. So I'll just open that up, have that ready to go for when we refer to that. So what I've said here, the first thing you should do is have a look through the Harry Seidler information, um, the introduction slideshow, sorry. And you'll be able to see um, there's a lot of information there about his background, about his the style of architecture he makes, including some of the famous works, um, famous architectural works he's made in Sydney, including Rose Seidler House, which is kind of what the, um, the case study is focused on. So it's focused on Harry Seidler in general, but as an example or as a way to further explore his work in detail, we have a look at Rose Seidler House, which is located on Sydney's North Shore. Um, and then I've also put a link here for the Harry Seidler Factors Affecting Design Task, and we'll go through that a little bit more in a second. So firstly, let's just have a look at the Harry Seidler introduction slideshow together. So it looks like this. Um, this is Harry Seidler here. And I've just put here the father of Australian modernist architecture because he really introduced um, modernist architecture to Australia. And we'll go through what that is as well. I don't expect you to know off the top of your head. Some of you might, but um, we'll have a look at that in more detail. So there's a bit about his biography here. Um, you can read through that, but basically, you know, he was um, born in Austria in 1923. Um, so, you know, coming of age, you know, 18, 19, he would have been, you know, right at the start of World War II. And being a, um, a Jewish man, he needed to kind of get out of that area at the time because it wasn't safe for um, Jewish people in Europe at that time. So... Yeah, he moved to a couple of different places, um, including Canada and England, before finally setting in Australia. Um, but he did study architecture in Canada and England. Um, as we said, you know, he's fled Europe. So this is all kind of background um, information about him. Um, but we're, we're more interested in, I mean, it's good for you to know and you kind of need to know this. It kind of makes more sense when analysing his work. But I, there's nothing I really need to explain more in depth. It's more just you reading and understanding about his biography. Um, so this, there's some important stuff here. So, you know, he did work at a couple of different places, um, especially in Canada. And this paragraph's important. So although he was, he was 10 years old when the Bauhaus was closed, so the Bauhaus is a, and I should explain this as well, the Bauhaus was a school um, of design 
So it, it included things like art, architecture, um, design, specifically things like furniture design and clothing design as well. Um, and it was a really kind of, it was a way of thinking. Um, so it was kind of, it came about after the war. Um, and, you know, just the end of the war, sorry. And it was kind of a, it was a really important movement in art and design. <coughs> All right, so let's, I'll let you read through that as well. So an important person to note here is um, Walter Gropius, who was a really influential figure in the Bauhaus movement. Um, so a bit more about him there. So this is looking at modernism and modernist architecture and design principles. So we, we look at a little bit of modernism here. Um, so modernist architecture or modernism is a style that emerged in the late in the early 20th century, sorry, in response to large scale changes in both technology and society. So it is associated with the function of buildings um, and an approach from an analytical viewpoint, a rational use of materials, um, the elimination of ornament and decoration, and openness to structural innovation. So there's a lot of big words there, but basically what it means is that um, the materials and the kind of shapes used kind of um, were influenced by the current technology of the time. So industrialization was a big thing. So there was large scale production of things like concrete, glass, um, big wooden beams. So, you know, it was the, a lot of the materials used in modernist architecture were inspired by the materials being introduced uh, or being produced in the world at the time. Um, another important thing here is the rational use of materials um, and the elimination of ornament. So how, you know, buildings and houses weren't designed to be pretty. There was no embellishment like, you know, sometimes you see on like Federation houses, like frilly ornaments um, around awnings and stuff like that. And there was nothing like that. It was very matter of fact. So lots of straight lines, um, really obvious and visible use of materials. So, you know, there might be a big concrete pillar somewhere or there might be, um, uncovered concrete, things like that. So some of the key principles, um, and we'll go through these together. So components positioned at 90 degrees to each other. Um, and maybe what we'll do is have a look at the some images of the Rose Side House, just as an example. Because, you know, I, I can talk about this at length, but unless I'm showing you what it looks like, um, you know, you might not pick up on what I'm talking about. You might get a different idea. So here's some photos that I took when I went there just to show last year's class. So let's have a look at that thing. So components positioned at 90 degrees to each, 90 degrees to each other and an emphasis on horizontal and vertical lines. So we can see here there's lots of really blocky, so 90 degree corners. Um, there's no curves anywhere. Um, what was the last point there? So emphasis on horizontal and vertical lines. So you can see even in the windows, you know, some of these window frames probably don't need to be there, but those, that repetitive use of horizontal and vertical lines was an important and really distinctive part of modernist architecture. The use of reinforced concrete and steel. So we can see here, it's just big concrete slabs basically that make up this house. And that was, you know, kind of related to the fact that through industrialization, these materials were more readily available. available. Visual expression of the structure rather than hiding structural elements. So we can see here really obvious, you know, poles, parts of the wall here. Um, so everything, there's nothing being hidden by decoration. It's all really visible and raw kind of architecture. Uh, rectangular and cubic shapes, which we can definitely see here um, and that kind of goes into the 90 degree um, components as well so asymmetrical compositions so we can see here you know the windows aren't exactly um, symmetrical they kind of look like they should be but they're not um, and that's a part of modernist architecture as well 
large windows. Yep, we can see that there. Um, open plan floors. So that, you know, kind of means that there's no, um, there's not a lot of doors inside the house. So you can kind of walk freely from one, one room into another. And if you go through the images here, you can kind of see that's what we've got. So, you know, obviously bedrooms and bathrooms have doors, but doors between elements like the kitchen and um, lounge room and kind of seating areas, there's not a lot of, um, there's no real doorways blocking those off. And you can have a look at the, um, the floor plans and sketches here as well. They're really interesting. <coughs> and white or cream facades. So a lack of, you know, decorative color there. And we can see that that kind of is what's happening in this, this architectural design. So, you know, like not every house is going to, not every modernist architectural piece is going to tick off all the boxes, but this one <clears throat> really does. And it's, um, that's kind of why we look at it as an example, because it doesn't have just a couple of the elements of modernism or modernist architecture has got all of them. Like it just hits all of those, those ticker boxes. So these are just some of the things. Um, <clears throat> some designs will emphasize some of these components more. Um, or principles, but um, these are the kind of basic things that we look at when we look at modernist architecture. So, um, Harry Sadler's influences, the Bauhaus, which we talked at, or which we talked about before a little bit. <clears throat> um, so, I'll let you read about that, and you can probably do a little bit of extra research there. Um, but the Bauhaus school argued, and this is where the Bauhaus School was formed from, that the end of the war initiated a new period in history and therefore a new style was needed to reflect that. So this style came about at the end of the war and it was kind of saying, you know, it's been such a horrible time, we need a break in design um, or a new rejuvenation of design to reflect the fact that we're in a new phase of history, basically. Um, and some of the key principles of Bauhaus architecture and design include um, uniting art with craft and mass production. So I'll let you read through there. Um, yep. Yeah. Form follows function. Um, so that basically means that it, what it means is that there was no decoration. So the the functionality or how the, the design is used is more important than what it looks like essentially. Minimalism. So linear and geometric forms um, and the avoidance of kind of curvy, um, curvy or curved lines. <clears throat> and this is a really um, central kind of idea to Bauhaus, which is the Gesamtkunstwerk, which means a total artwork. Um, so it's a synthesis in which multiple art forms are unified through architecture. So for instance, in the Rose Seidler house, he didn't, Harry Seidler didn't just design you know, the exterior of the building and the walls inside, etc. He also designed the furniture that went into it. Um, so it was, a, it was a complete, a total work of art there. Um, so here's just some more examples of Bauhaus architecture, and you can kind of see those, they relate, like you can see the connection to the Rose Seidler House and those in inclusion of modernist architectural principles there. So the rose height side of the house in Warunga. Um, these are some of the designs that Harry Seidler's made in Sydney. Rose side of the house, which we looked at and which you're going to be focusing on for this task. Um, the Horizon Apartments in Darlinghurst. Um, so near William Street, near the big Coca-Cola sign near King's Cross. Um, you'll see these. Uh, the Williamson or Igloo House in Mossman and the Seidler House in Southern Highlands, which is a really impressive place that you can book out for a very a lot of money if you have it. So let's leave it there for Harry Seidler. Um, and the next video in this series, I'll, I will talk about the task that you need to do.